In this video, we're going to review how to do arithmetic with a whole bunch of different objects. So arithmetic of decimal numbers, complex numbers, polynomials, rational expressions, and radicals. So as a mathematician, our playing toolbox contains the addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division of whole numbers. And we're going to see how to expand those ideas to these objects that you see here. So playing in mathematics means how can we create rules that will tell us how to add, subtract, multiply, divide, decimal number, complex numbers, polynomials, rational expressions, and radicals. So what is addition? Addition is a binary operation. Binary means it operates on two objects with specific rules. The objects themselves are called addend or summand. Addends, so if I write 2 plus 3, then 2 and 3 are the addends or summands. Note that you can add two or more objects if they have the same unit. I cannot have two apples and three oranges. I cannot add them unless I looked at them as fruits. Two fruit and three fruit will give me five fruits. So the notation for addition is the plus sign. So let's see if you can answer these true or false. Go ahead, pause the video here and see if you can understand whether 5 inch plus 3 inch equals 8 is true or false and so on. Go ahead, pause the video and answer it. Assuming you've come back, what you probably noticed is that 5 inch plus 3 inch is 8 inches. So if you don't put unit, then you're not going to have a true statement for the first one. Same thing with the second one. Third one, you have 3 and 7 add up to 10 plus 5, 5 inches. So th number 3 is true. What about number 4? It looks like they are not identical units. However, there are times when we can convert one unit into another. So 5 feet, 1 foot is 12 inches. So 5 feet would be 60 inches. So number 4 is false because they're not like units, so you can't add them. But number five is converting five feet to 60 inches allows us to add and write 67 inches. So now let's start with when you were in kindergarten, you were asked to go three apples plus four apples equals what? You probably are wondering why we're spending so much time on kindergarten stuff. But that actually forms the basis of higher level mathematics. So let's start with three apples. The way we do counting number addition is you take the three apples and you count four up from three apples. So we have three apples, four apples, five apples, six apples, seven apples. That's my fourth apple added. So when you add four apples to three apples, you end up with seven apples. You just counted four up from three. That's how you learn how to add when you are in kindergarten or first grade. So the answer to three apples plus four apples is seven apples. What if I ask you to do the reverse question? What if I ask you what's four apples plus three apples? What would your answer be? Pause and think before you answer. So you're going to start with four apples and count three up from four. So five, six, and the third apple will give me seven. So clearly, you get seven apples, even if you do four apples plus three apples. And you might be saying to yourself, that's a no-brainer. That's nothing really to this. But actually, it's a very important observation that we have here, that four apples plus three apples is seven apples. Three apples plus four apples is also seven apples. So another way to see this problem would be we have three apples here, four apples here for a total of seven apples. but if you started with four apples and then added three more apples, it's still seven apples. This property where the order in which you added did not matter is called the commutative property of addition. In mathematics, several uh, objects satisfy property where if you add one plus another and reverse the order of addition, you still get the same answer. That's called the commutative property of addition. These words are going to be important for you to memorize because later on when we ask you to justify a statement, justify 
your logic or your thinking process on a problem, you should be able to say, I have this answer because I was using commutative property of addition. So you should be familiar with it. So if we let, so this property works not just for numbers, but right now we're saying if A and B are any two mathematical objects that you've studied so far in module one, then A plus B is equal to B plus A. Or the summons can change order and the resulting addition does not change. And the terminology we want you to keep in mind is what? Addition is commutative. Just remember that word. Remember, we use the word commute in daily life, going back and forth. So you can add A and B back and forth and get the same answer. All right, let's see the word associative property. Associative, we use the word associate all the time also. Anyway, let's take a look at three apples plus two apples. So that will give me five apples. And if I add four more apples to it, then I'll end up with nine apples. You can count, right? Three, four, five, and then six, seven, eight, nine. So that's nine apples. I'm adding the three and the two apples first, and then whatever that result is, adding four apples to it to get nine apples. What if I do the following? If I add three apples to the result of the addition of two and four apples, so two apples and four apples will give me six apples, and then three apples plus six apples will give me nine apples. So in other words, it did not matter what order you added them in. You could add three and two first, and then add the four to it, or you can add three to the addition of two and four. This can be true with all the mathematical objects you've studied so far. So if A, B, and C represent any three mathematical objects we've studied so far, then if you add A plus B plus C, where you're adding the A and the B first and then the C, or you can add A to the result of the addition of B and C, the answer is going to be the same. This is called the associative property of addition. So addition is associative. That's another way to say that. In other words, you can change the summons and the sum is not affected. And if you combine it with the previous property, which was what? Do you remember the name? Good. Commutative property of addition. If you combine associative property and commutative property, which means you can interchange the order in which you add them, or does not matter which two you add first, it will give us what? That you can add objects in any order they appear as long as you add all of them. So I can add A and C first and then B to it, or I can add B and C first and then A to it. It does not matter as long as you add them all. Something to keep in mind. All right, let's take a look at additive identity. Well, let's just consider zero apples and see how they interact with the four apples. If you add zero apples to the existing collection of four apples, or if you add four apples to zero apples, you end up with four apples, which means that if you add a zero to any number or any mathematical object for that matter, then what happens? The quantity does not change. So in general, additive identity, in this particular case, our additive identity is zero, is the following. If we let A be any mathematical object, and we add the number so that the result is the same, nothing changed, then that number is called additive identity. In our case, it's zero, because A plus zero is A, and zero plus A is also A. So zero is going to be additive identity for us. Just keep that in mind. All right, let's take a look at addition of counting numbers in general then. If you're working with counting numbers like we did 3 plus 4, then you counted 4 up from 3. What if you have 26 apples plus 59 apples? That means you're going to have to count 59 up from 26, like 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. Wait a minute. I'm not going to be counting 59 up from 26. That's not very practical, is it? So to add numbers in our decimal systems, because you're a mathematician, you have to find an easier way. You're not going to sit there counting 59 up from 26. So what do we do? What we do is we line up our decimals so that each place value is lined up. 
This allows us to add like units, the unit being the place value. And then we only have to add numbers 0 through 9. So let's see how that works. So we can visualize the 26 apples and the 59 apples the following way. We have uh, 26 apples can be thought of as having two boxes of 10 apples and six loose apples. And 59 apples can be thought of as five boxes of 10 apples and nine loose apples. So if you have 10 apples, they form a box. And if you have loose apples, then you can combine them. So if you have nine loose apples and six, I can take one apple from this six, add this to the nine, and make one whole box. And so now there are five more apples left. So we have five single loose apples left. And here we have eight boxes. So lining up the decimal place values allows us to add. All right, so you know how to add whole numbers. What we're going to do is see if you can use the basic underlying principles of adding whole numbers and expand whole number addition process to decimal numbers. This is what mathematicians do. They take a process, but if you can underline principles become clearer to you, you can use that knowledge to expand those principles to other objects. So our goal here is not just to be able to rote memorization, do the drill and skill process of adding uh, decimal numbers, but to understand what the underlying principle is. So pause the video here, do these two problems, and then we'll discuss it together. You know the drill now that whenever I say pause the video, I really mean it. Because if you do the problems and start to understand or observe the basic connections between the two problems, you will be able to do so much more than just adding decimal numbers. All right, so let's take a look at what you might have done. The answer is 578, and hopefully you got that. If not, pay attention. We are lining up the digits and their place values. So all the hundreds are together, tens are together, units are together. And, and we just add like units, right? So all the units got added, tens got added, hundreds got added. Seven and one is eight units, three and four tens is seven tens, and 200, 300 will give me five hundreds. Let's take a look at how that changes when you have the 2 in the units place, 3 in the tenths place, 7 in the hundredths place. Same process. You can see uh, line up the place values. And the only difference is that in the first problem, the 5 is in the hundredths place, whereas in the second problem, the 5 is in the units place. So remember, the decimal point is always between the units place and the tenths of place, right? So the process between these two didn't really change that much, except for that the value of that 5 in the first problem was 100, whereas here it's 5 units or singletons. All right, let's see if you can observe this pattern and do this whole number addition. So pause the video and go ahead and do that. Please don't use a calculator because we're trying to teach you the basic underlying process so you can expand your thinking to other objects. You can, of course, do this problem by punching buttons on a calculator and get the right answer. But here, right now, we want to focus on not just getting the right answer, but also how did the answer come about? You need to understand the underlying principle. So let's follow the same process we did before. So we line up the digits, and of course, you can add more place values if you need them, thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands, or units, tens, hundreds, and so on. So right now, I'm lining up my digits. I have 7 plus 9, so that will give me 16, right? So I have 16 units. But we are in base 10 system, so we can't really work with the 16. We have to have six singletons, and that one group of tens will have to go in the tens column because each place value has its own spot. So that one, we're going to have to move it to the tens spot. Now we look at how many tens we got. We have one plus five, six tens, 
plus 8 tens, which will give you, what, 14 tens. So let's put that there. We have 14 tens. However, again, just like the units, we know that in decimal number system, 10 of something makes the next one in the next place value, higher place value. So 10 of a lower quantity makes one of the next higher place value. So 10 tens would make 100. So that one needs to belong in the 100 spot right here. All right, let's add up all of these. 8 and 1 will be 9. 9 and 7 is 16. And again, 10 hundreds make 1,000. So that 1 will have to go in the thousands column. There are no other digits left to add, so that 1 will be in the thousand spot. So our addition is going to be 1,646. So the basic underlying principle here was adding like units. And remembering that sometimes there may not have, like units and tens are not like units, but 10 of one unit became one tens. 10 of tens made one a hundred. So sometimes, even if they are not like units, there may be an exchange or conversion from one unit to another. But the underlying principle for whole number addition or decimal number addition is what? If you had to hypothesize, what do you think that would be? That would be adding like units. So let's look at the decimal number system addition, but through a different way of writing things. So that we can expand our idea of decimal number addition to other objects that you saw in module 1. So here is 321 plus 546. I'm going to write these numbers in expanded form. So that's 3 groups of 10 squares or 100, two groups of 10s plus one singleton. In the next number, we have five groups of 10 squared or 100, four groups of 10s, and six. So when we added them, we added like terms. So we said three plus five groups of 10 squares, two plus four groups of 10s, and one plus six groups of singletons, which gave me eight hundreds, six 10s, seven singletons, or 867. Now, if you remember in module one, do you remember any object in which we replaced base 10 with something else, and it became another object? Who can give me that answer? Do you remember what happens if you take this expanded notation and replace the 10 with, say, x's? Aha! I am glad you remember, so that's Correct, it is a polynomial. So we have, instead of 10, we have x. So we had 3 times 10 squared. Now we have 3 times x squared. Remember, when you read this, it will be 3x squared, which is really 3 times x squared. So an alternative to decimal numbers when you replace 10s with x's is polynomials. So if I know how to add decimal numbers, then I know how to add polynomials without anybody teaching me what to do. So this, we're trying to show you how a mathematician works. So what I'm going to do now is ask you to pause the video here, use the problem 321 plus 546, and see if you can come up with how you would add 3x squared plus 2x plus 1, to 5x squared plus 4x plus 6. So go ahead, pause the video, and then we'll take a look and see if you agree with the answer. So don't wait or far fast forward. Please pause the video. All right, so let's see what we got. So we have a same structure, which will give us 8x squared, 6x's, and 7. Again, we were adding like terms. So 3x squared and 5x squared gave you 8x squared. 2x and 4x gave you 6x. And 1 plus 6 gave you the 7. So if you look, nothing different here. There is no real advanced mathematical concepts here, except that you were adding like terms. 3 of something, 5 of something, giving you 8 of something. You see? All right, let's take a look at an Another problem here. So same decimal number addition, and then look what happens. 
If you were to line these numbers up, we saw that we had carryover. So we had 14 here. So we're going to have one group of 10 and four singletons. Here we have 16 groups of 10. So we have six tens and one group of 100. Here we have 12 groups of 10 squared. So you're going to have uh, 2 times 10 squared plus one group of thousands. We had a carryover, right? And so here we're having 5 plus 7. 7 plus 9 and 8 plus 6, place value addition. But then if we had carryover, we have to move them over. So what kind of number are you going to end up with then? So we have four singletons. We have six groups of 10 and one group of 10, giving you seven groups of 10. We have two hundreds and one hundred, giving you three hundreds, and then one group of thousands. So 1,374. Now. If you had to create an equivalent polynomial addition problem, how would you write that? Instead of 578, what would I write, do you think? You got it. 5x squared plus 7x plus 8, 7x squared plus 9x plus 6. So pause the video here and go ahead, figure out what that addition will be like. You truly need to pause and do it. Again, adding like terms, right? Assuming you have come back, 5x squared, 7x squared. Just like 5 10 squares and 7 10 squares will give you 12 10 squares. So take a look. 5 plus 7x squares, 7 plus 9x's, and 8 plus 6. So we have 12x squared, 16x, and 14. It's the same here, 12 groups of 100. 16 groups of 10, and 14 singletons. However, in the decimal number addition, we had carryovers because 10 units make one group of 10. 10 tens make one group of 100. 10 hundreds make one group of 1,000. However, here, if you look, 14 is going to remain 14. We cannot have a carryover because we didn't have an x in it. X's are not going to add up suddenly to give you x squares. So there are no carryovers here. We just have 12x squared plus 16x plus 14. That is my answer for this problem. So in general then, polynomial and decimal number additions are similar in what way? That you're adding like terms, right? x squared, 10 squared, 10x. However, the old dissimilarity is that in decimal number addition, I have carryovers, but in polynomial addition, there is no carryover. All right, so let's see if you can use that in-depth analysis of whole number addition to figure out how to add the following. Let me give you some practice problems. So here are some problems. See if you can do the problems, write down what you think is the answer, and then we'll discuss it together and see what similarities or differences are between all these problems, all right? So go ahead, pause the video and see what you can do. Are you pausing? All right, let's start with A. 2 plus 15 will give you 17, right? What about 2 apples and 15 apples? Can I say 17? Yes, 17, but 17 what? Right, 17 apples. So if you're adding apples, you need to have 17 apples. All right, let's talk about C. 2 square root 3 plus 15 square root 3, just like the 2 apples, 15 apples give you 17 apples. Here we'll have 17 what? Square root 3s. So the answer here will be 17 square root 3. Let's take a look at the next one. What do you think you got for that? Speak out loud. Even though I'm not right there next to you, speak out loud what your answer is and see if it makes sense to you. 2x squared plus 15x squared. Did any one of you get 17x uh, to the fourth? If so, please be cautious because look, 2 apples, 15 apples, give me 17 apples, not apple squared. The apple stayed apples. So in this case, it will be 17x squared. Don't confuse x squared plus x squared with x squared times x squared. So let's talk about that caution in just a little bit. So again, when you add something, that unit, 
apples, x squared, square root 3, it's going to stay. So the caution was, what's the difference between x squared plus x squared and x squared times x squared? We did exponent rules, and so some of you might be looking at x squared plus x squared as x squared times x squared. This is a good lesson in reading out loud a mathematics problem as opposed to glancing at it and immediately coming up with an answer to come up with an answer without processing what is being asked. So this is a good time to review what is a habit energy. Remember in mindfulness uh, presentation in module zero, we talked about habit energy. We are so driven by fast speed. Everything is fast in your life. The websites that you click on, if it takes more than uh, 20 seconds, a lot of you, including myself, will respond, oh, so slow. So everything around you moves fast. But learning mathematics and doing mathematics is a slow, steady process. So remember habit energy. We talked about habit energy. We are in a habit of rushing. There is no need to rush here. You have nowhere to go, nothing else to do. Just focus on the math problems in front of you one at a time. It is OK if you want to pause after every 10 minutes because your attention span only is 10 minutes. If your attention span is longer, then work longer. But start to get to know you. It's very important you know yourself. And you also want to make sure that you remember you are on your own here. There is no time limit on how fast you respond. Even on exams, take time, read, make sure you understand what the question is asking, then respond with an answer. I would recommend reading the problem out loud in your head, even if you don't make a noise, as opposed to just glancing at it, because that will prevent you from making the mistakes that we're talking about. All right, so one way if you do answer and you are not sure if your answer is correct, 2x squared plus x squared, a trick that I have used with my students, which works really well. But you have to trust me that this is going to work. So even if you answered correct, it might be good for you to go through this exercise. So I would recommend, I'm going to stop talking for just 10 seconds because I want you to close your eyes. No, really, truly close your eyes. Trust me. You might be saying, what the heck? Why are you making me close my eyes? But if you trust in this next experiment that we are doing, you will see what I'm trying to do. So close your eyes, and I'm going to blurt out a whole bunch of problems, and you just quickly answer without thinking. Ready? Close your eyes. OK, ready? All right, apple plus apple, oranges plus oranges, boxes plus boxes. Wiggy jiggies plus wiggy jiggies. In case you didn't hear that, don't look. Wiggy jiggies plus wiggy jiggies. X plus X. X squared plus X squared. OK, now open your eyes. What did you notice? That if you were not sure what X squared plus X squared was, by throwing in other objects, so you have apple plus apple, two apples, oranges plus oranges, two oranges, Boxes plus boxes, two boxes, wiggy jiggies plus wiggy jiggies. What the heck is wiggy jiggy? You might be thinking, but that's OK. Don't worry about that. It's two wiggy jiggies. I just made that up, by the way. It's just uh, something silly. But the point was that all of these things added to two whatevers, two apples, two oranges, two boxes, two wiggy jiggies, two x's, two x squares. Throwing in a problem that you are stuck on amidst other problems that you know how to do really fast Sometimes a student will answer questions correct, not even knowing that they just answered it. So you're cultivating how to trust your intuition, your innate ability. So remember x squared times x squared, base is x, exponent is 2. Do you remember your exponent rules? What happens to a product when the bases are the same? You have x times x, x times x, so you have four x's. So the exponent is 4. So always remember, there is no need to rush into an answer. You have time to process what operation you're doing, what 
mathematical principles you're using, then answer and you will not make mistakes like adding x squared and x squared and changing the exponent to x to the fourth because unit is x squared, so x squared will remain. You just need to count how many x squares you got. All right, let's continue then our discussion. So recall that i is square root negative 1. So again, pause the video here, and I would like you to attempt these problems. We have not taught you how to add these things, but I want you to understand how they're really no different than what you have been doing. The goal here is to understand the basic principle of adding, which is adding like units. So let's look at complex numbers 3 plus 4i plus 5 plus 7i. How can you add them? Pause the video here and attempt all of them. Assuming you have come back from pausing, here we go. We have uh, 3 and 5 are like units. They are the real parts of a complex number. 4i and 7i, that forms the imaginary part. So 4 plus 7 will give you the imaginary part. So you're adding real parts and imaginary parts, giving the number 8 plus 11i. 3 plus 5 is 8, 4 and 7 is 11 i's. So let's take a look at these then. You can see they all have similarities. They have 3 of something plus 4 of something different, 5 of the same thing plus 7 of the other thing. So 3 cube root 4 plus 5 cube root 4, right? So cube root 4 is our unit. We have 4 square root 2 and 7 square root 2, so 4 plus 7 square root 2. And so the answer would be 8 cube root 4s plus 11 square root 2s. Everybody OK with that? If not, go back and review again the first one, the second one. Let's do the next one then. Do you think you can do the next one if you didn't get the first two? Pause the video and let's give you a chance to attempt the second, uh, the third problem and the fourth problem. Yep, you're going to have 8a to the power 2 thirds and 11b to the power 4 fifths because, again, you're adding like terms. The next one, you're going to have 3 square root x's and 5 square root x's. So that will give you 8 square root x's and 11 square root x plus 1's. You cannot combine square root x and square root x plus 1 because the square root means, again, it's an exponent. x is the base, half is the exponent. x plus 1 is the base, half is the exponent. They are different bases, so you cannot combine these. But look at the similarity between all of these problems. The difference is, is that the units are different. But otherwise, you're truly just adding like terms. All right. So it's very important that you understand how you write, how you speak, and how you present your mathematical work is extremely important. Because if there are lots of studies that show that if you don't speak correct, write correct, or present your work correct mathematical notation, you can have issues in your underlying understanding of basic principles. So there are many ways to do this next problem. Again, add like terms. So some people circle the like units using colored pens. This is student work that I have collected across the years, and that's perfectly fine. So you have 15 square root 7s and 10 cube root 5s, and you can see they circle the square root 7 green, uh, the square root 7 red, and cube root 5 green, so that you understand what the units are. Another person chose to, wrote, uh, cho chose to write where they underline, single underline for like units of square root 7, and double underline for like units of cube root 5. And then again, you can see the work there. This is also perfectly acceptable. Sometimes people cross things out to keep track of what the roots are that they're adding. So single cross for square root 7, double cross for square root 5. I would very much recommend against this as unacceptable mathematical notation. Crossing out means it's gone. It's not gone. It's still here. I understand what people are trying to do here. So what I would instead recommend is writing it like this. 
You can always make the four mice only column that we talked about in module zero. Do that crossing out stuff on the side here. And then, however, when you come back, your work is clean. You don't have to underline square root sevens or cube root fives. You're really just trying to keep track of what the like units are and add like terms. So this is acceptable. All right, so it's very important to remember we keep talking about growth mindset. Remember, you can increase your intelligence by simply challenging yourself. So we know how to add now, add like terms. So let's challenge your brains and see if you can do these next fill in the blank problems. So in the first one, we have a blank for you. And we're saying, OK, instead of adding like terms, we are giving you the answer. So see if you can pause the video here and fill in the quantity in this blank so that the first polynomial plus second polynomial add up to the answer that is provided. See what you can do. Assuming you've attempted it, let's take a look. We know 12 x squares plus something giving you 15. So we have to count up 13, 14, 15. So that will be 3x squares. 5 plus 7 will give me 12, and 4 plus 5 will give me 9. And so you know that 3x squares plus 7x plus 5 will give us the answer of 15x squared plus 12x plus 9. So it's just another way of doing the same problem. This is challenging yourself, doing the problem any which way that appears out of context, you'll be able to do the problems. Let's try another one similar to that, except this time we're not giving you either of the terms. None of the summoned. Remember, summoned is the quantities that we're adding. So two quantities add up to that. Pause the video here and see what you want to try. It may feel like, uh-oh, I can't do this, can't do this. So stop saying, I cannot do something. But give it a shot. What's the worst that will happen that you have a wrong answer? Remember, taking wrong turns while you're learning is an important, crucial step in making sure you understand the material to its core. So go ahead. So pause the video here and see what you can do. In case you are really stuck, how about I give you this first one? I can make whatever I want here. So I'll say 8x squared, 4x plus 2. You can pick anything you want here. But once I pick that, now I'm stuck because I want to add up to 15. So 8 and 7x squared will give me 15x squared. 4x and 8x will give me 12x. 2 and 7 will add up to 9. All right, so now you do another one. Go ahead, pause the video, and you try it. How sure are you that you got the right answer? <clears throat> Let me show you another example. Maybe somebody picked 10x squared and 3x plus 4. Then I would need 5x squared. I would need 9x and 5 to add up to the 9. So 3x and 9x is 12x. 4 and 5 will give me 9. <clears throat> so here's some questions I want you to think about. Do you think that the answers for the first one and the second one is unique? Unique means that only one answer possible. Or do you think there are other possibilities? Well, let's investigate. If you first summoned is fixed, in, like in the first blank, you only had to fill in the second blank. So if I have already 12x squared, the only way I am going to add up to 15x squared is going to be if I had 3x squared. The only way I'm going to get 5x is if I added 7x. And the only way I'll get 9 from a 4 is if I added a 5. But here we had two blanks. In that case, you have freedom to choose whatever first polynomial you want. And then the second polynomial will have to be fixed because you have to add up to 15x squared plus 12x plus 9. So no, the answer for the second one is not unique. How many more people there are, that's how many more answers you can come up with. So all infinitely many possible answers for the second blank. And you don't even have to stick to 
whole number coefficients, right? I could have 10.1 x squared. Then instead of 2x squared, I will have 1.9x squared. So play with that to really get familiar with these kind of problems. All right, so we've learned how to extend our definition of decimal number addition to other objects. So let's take some examples where they're not polynomials, but they are things like 3 feet 6 inches, 9 feet 8 inches. So to do this problem, let's make our uh, grid like we did for decimal number system. Let's also add 6 inches, 8 inches, giving us 14 inches. And so in the format as only column, let's work with the 14 inches because we know that 12 inches makes a foot. So the 14 inches can be broken as 12 inches plus 2 inches, so 1 foot 12, 2 inches. So over here, this 14 can be broken as 1 foot 12 inches. So let's keep the 2 inches and the 1 foot needs to move over because the feet columns is over here. Let's add up these. So 9 and 1, 10, 11, 12, 13, 13 feet. So here we have no carryover because we're only working with feet and inches. If you were working with yards or something, then you can do an additional conversions. But for now, our answer will be 13 feet 2 inches. So sometimes, even though we do not have a decimal number system, they behave very similarly. So many inches make one foot, 12 inches make a foot, so we have to do a carryover. So let's take a look at what if possibilities. What happens if I have a problem like two inches and three quarters of an inch? Well, how would you give me an answer? If I say add two inches plus three quarters of an inch, well, you would say I have two and three quarters inch, right? So another way to say that would be two and three quarters as a number, as a whole two inches plus three quarters. So two and three quarters, it's a mixed number. And what it really means is it's two plus three quarters inch. So observation is that sometimes, even though we could combine the inches part together, the two plus three quarters had to remain as two plus three quarters, unless I converted it into a improper fraction. But if I want to write it as a mixed fraction, it's going to be parentheses two plus three quarters, and that's how many inches I got. So let's see if we can use this observation to our benefit and work on these problems. So I'm going to have you pause the video here and attempt these problems on your own for practice. The first one, we already know it's x plus 1, 2x plus 1s, and 7x plus 1s will give us unit is x plus 1, so I'm going to have 9x plus 1s. Does that make sense? So I have 2 plus 7x plus 1s, which is 9x plus 1s. Use the same principle here, so unit in the next one is x plus 1. Tell me what answer I should write for b. Go ahead, pause the video. So that will become, what, 2 plus a copies of x plus 1. But we can't really add 2 plus a. This is just like the 2 plus 3 quarters inch problem. So the answer is just going to be that. A lot of you might be tempted in multiplying that out and adding like terms. That is OK also. But right now, we are just focusing on adding like terms where the units remain as they are. So in this case, x plus 1 is my unit, and you just add them. I don't want you to distribute the 2 and the 7 or the 2 and the a and add it together. I really want you to just play with how to add like terms. And so this would be another way to write this addition problem. All right, so next one unit would be what? That's correct, square root 2x plus 1. And so then you're going to end up with 10 square root 2x plus 1s. All right, let's try another set. So pause the video here and see what you can do. So if you look here, it doesn't look like 3 square root 2 and 5 can be combined, but x, you're counting how many x's you got. 
So our unit is x. So we have 3 square root 2 plus 5 x's. In the next one, a plus b is my unit. And so you're going to have 3 plus u plus v, a plus b. What about the next one? You can see this whole square root 5 a p plus q. That whole thing is also repeated here. So it's like the wiggy jiggy that we did. Wiggy jiggy plus wiggy jiggy would be 2 wiggy jiggy. So this would be 2 uh, square root 5a p plus q. Let's do the next one. We have centimeters and square centimeters. Centimeters measures length. Square centimeters measures area. So add them like, so we have 13 centimeters and 8 square centimeters. 